pray together. God, as we prepare to turn to your word and hear about your son Jesus riding towards Jerusalem as the triumphant king, we pray that we would also lay down those things in our lives that keep us from you, that interfere from us hearing from you, and that we would worship and honor you as King Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. A couple of months ago, our family made the trip to Edmonton, and when you are in Edmonton, you have to go where? West Edmonton Edmonton Mall. What else are you going to do? You got to go to West Edmonton Mall. So we went to the water slides, and I had never been in in a water slide like this. I think we have a picture of this. Have you been in one of these? You go into a tube at the top of the water slide, okay? And you're in this tube, and at your feet, there is a trap door, okay? And so that's that's not me, okay, this is, these aren't my feet, but you're in this tube, and there's a trap door, and then it counts down, three, two, one, and then pff, the trap door flops open. <laughs> that looks a lot like me, doesn't it? <laughs> what is, it's not me, it's just some guy, some guy. I'm sure I made that exact same face. It's this fascinating situation where you know what's going to happen. I knew before I got there that those water slides were there. I was like, yeah, I want to do one of those. And, you know, you pay and you get your swimsuit on and you walk up a thousand stairs to get to the top and you wait your turn in line and then you're standing in this thing. They go, okay, this will be good. And they close the door and you hear the countdown and all of a sudden you think, dear Lord. (laughs) I'm pretty sure that's what I said. Dear Lord. (laughs) And then, like, there's no going back. There's no stopping you. It is in full motion. And as we think about Palm Sunday this morning, I I like that picture because there's been a lot of lead up. Just like there was lots of lead up to me going to the water slide, lots of lead up. And there's that moment in the present where you're in in the tube and it's all about to happen. And then you're launched and there's no going back. And I got to the bottom of the slide and my first thought was, I got to try that again. I got to do that again. We've all heard the Palm Sunday story, I think, before, and it's one of those ones that's very familiar. How many of you have ever waved a palm in church on a Sunday morning? Yes, we didn't get the palms this year, but, uh, but, but you, we've been there. I was hearing actually this morning about another church. They brought in not only palms, but a donkey uh, to church wearing a diaper, <laughs> of, course. <laughs> of course. And then at the end, you could have donkey rides. Uh, we're Sorry, we're not doing that either, but we do have cookies at the end. (laughs) But we've heard Palm Sunday a lot of times, and I hope this morning as we go through it, I really want you to hear this, that Jesus is king past, present, and forever, that he is truly king of kings, king above all things, king above everything else in all of creation. And one of the things that he comes to bring to us, and one of the things he announces Palm Sunday is peace. Man, I think all of us could handle more peace in our, in, just in our own minds and peace in our relationships, peace in our family, peace in our country, peace in the world. And Jesus comes to bring an amazing peace. Let's think for a second again about Palm Sunday. Uh, who here skis? Because skiing, skiing is similar. Yeah, okay, we have some skiers here. Did you ever find yourself at the top of the mountain accidentally? Like with all your gear on, skis on, did you ever get there and be like, oh, how did this happen? Of course not. There's all of this lead up, right? There's all those things, grabbing your gear, driving to the mountain, you know, paying for your ticket, getting on the lift, all, the, all of that lead up. And there's lots of lead up on Palm Sunday as well. And, and we'll find that, or one of those places in Zechariah 9, this will be a familiar passage for you. It says this, rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem, see your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. These words uh, by the prophet uh, Zechariah are written about 500 years before Jesus comes. And, And so for 500 years, they know that this is a messianic prophecy. It's prophesying when the Messiah, the Savior, the one that they've been waiting for, the anointed one will come. They've been waiting for 500 years rehearsing these words. So they know, they know what they're looking for. This king's going to come, he's going to be riding on this colt, this foal of a donkey, and we should rejoice when we see this happen because God has finally sent the Messiah, 
that we're waiting for. And there's all sorts of ideas about what this Messiah will do and, and how he'll, uh, what we should be shouting about. Some people think he will be a political leader, he'll be a military leader. Most thoughts at the time of the day were that he would reestablish Israel as this great nation, okay, a powerful nation once again, because at this point where Jesus uh, is living in Israel, they're under the uh, rule of the Roman Empire, and so they want to be set free. They want to be their own nation once again. There's other prophecies about uh, this. In fact, the prophecy from Daniel um, seems to foretell, many people think, down to the exact day. If you remember the passage in Daniel 7, I think, where it talks about uh, 70 weeks and 70 years and 70 days, it brings us from this time of Daniel straight to, they believe, Palm Sunday. So there was this expectation, not only that it would happen, but there, that there was a time frame, there was a counting clock leading them to this event. But that's all distant past, right? That's 500 years before Jesus. There's this lead up, there's this excitement, there's this anticipation, which makes a bit of sense when you think about Jesus and the times where people wanted to make him a king. Do you remember that in the Gospels? Like after he feeds the 5,000 fish and loaves, they want to make him king. They're ready to announce him as their king. And Jesus always uh, rejects that. He, he, he is often more quiet about what he's doing. Uh, sometimes telling people not to tell anyone else that they've been healed or cured or freed because he's waiting for the right time to announce his kingship. But now, as he approaches Jerusalem, something changes. Something changes and Jesus says, okay, the, the time for subtlety is gone. And now he, he hops up on this colt, this full of a donkey. And there's already all this excitement in the crowd. It's already Passover. It's this big festival that they're going to. Uh, imagine uh, tens of thousands of people going to the same place, almost like you're going to a Canucks game, right? And there's tons of excitement because you think that this might be the day that they win, right? Not, not when you're leaving and you're all sad and depressed, you paid $300 to watch them lose. But the excitement going toward, I mean, that's the kind of excitement they have as everyone's seeing friends in the crowd, family members, and as they go to celebrate the Passover, reminding them that God has set them free from slavery under the Egyptians. It says this in Matthew 21. As they approached Jerusalem and came, came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Then in Luke it says this, those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. Okay, so just in case you missed that, we read Zechariah 9 to start. Matthew quotes that exact same passage, okay? He's saying these two things are connected. Zechariah from 500 years ago and what Jesus did on this day, these are the same event. Jesus is fulfilling that prophecy about the king coming, about the Messiah from God coming to Jerusalem riding on a donkey. Just to kind of put this in a modern lens, imagine that uh, the Jesus is coming today, okay? He is coming, and he hasn't done Palm Sunday already, so he's coming from the east, uh, from Langley, okay? And he's coming down the Langley Bypass, and as he's walking with his disciples, he says, hey, go ahead of me. You're going to run to uh, Dam's Ford, okay? You're going to see a Mustang in the parking lot. Get to the Mustang, open the door, hot wire, come pick me up. Okay, and then we're going to ride into Cloverdale down to Hillside Christian Church, right? Okay, so that's what happens. And the disciples run ahead, and they, you know, they pop the door open, and they're hot wiring the car, and the manager comes up and says, hey, what, why, what are you guys doing? And they respond, it's okay, the Lord needs it. How do you think that would go? Hard to say, hard to say, but for some reason, either Jesus already knows these people, or they know Jesus by reputation, and so when they say the Lord needs it, they're like, yeah. Great, take it. Something interesting here is that we're told uh, in the Gospels that this is a cult that has never been ridden. 
Picture that, a quote that has never, ever been written, suddenly is going to be written for the very first time, not in some peaceful field or meadow, but with tens of thousands of people gathered around it. And are they walking quietly? No, they're shouting at the tops of their their lungs. I think this is miraculous. This is miraculous in that this cult finds peace in the presence and company of Jesus. Some people speculate that maybe this is why we're told in Matthew that the the cult and the mother are brought at the same time. Maybe the mother brings some peace and comfort to this cult as well. Continues at verse 7. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread the cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. The moment he gets up on that colt, there is no turning back. The crowd sees it, and it's exactly what they've been waiting for, hoping for, longing for, and they start shouting and cheering, this is the king, here he comes, this is the one we've been waiting for for hundreds of years. Picture being in that, in that water slide. Again, okay, you're in the tube. It's counted down three, two, one. The trap door has let go. It's too late to change your mind. You can say, excuse me, sir, I, cha- I don't want to go, right? It's only this at that point, right? You are flying down the tube. As Jesus gets on that colt, there's no going back. There's no putting this back in the bag or, or making it secretive once again. The, the announcement of Jesus as king, has been fully declared before all of these people. And now people in Jerusalem, maybe who have never even heard of Jesus before, are saying, who is this? What's going on? What's all the excitement about? And there's the answer. It's it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth. He's finally come to Jerusalem as king. They shout, Hosanna to the son of David, David is the, the pinnacle, the greatest king that they have had. If Jesus is the son of David, that makes him what? The king, right? He's heir to the throne. They maybe don't understand it fully yet, but Jesus already was king, king over all creation. And now they are about to announce him and acclaim him as the king who has come. They had this prophecy about a coming king, and at this very moment, Jesus announces himself as that king, and they're waving palm branches. We sang in one of our songs, the victor branches. Palm branches signified victory. As your army returned from battle, if they were victorious, you'd be waving palm branches. Yes, we did it. We conquered our enemies. But palm branches had also come to symbolize Israel as a nation. Here comes our king, and we will be restored We will be set free. We'll be a great and mighty nation again. While all this is happening, while the crowds are cheering, the religious leaders are plotting two murders. Listen to this from John's Gospel. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead, So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For on account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. Not everybody. Not everyone was excited about Jesus. Not everyone today is excited about Jesus. And and they were willing to do anything to get rid of him. In fact, let's not just kill him. Let's kill Lazarus as well. Because too many people are believing his story about being dead for four days And coming back from the grave. There are those who want to crown Jesus and those who want to kill Jesus. It's only one or the other. I want to ask you, what what part of that crowd are you in? And before you say, of course I want to crown Jesus, that's why I woke up, that's why I'm here this morning. Let me ask you another question. Are you prepared to fully give him the throne? Because in so many of our lives, 
we say, yeah, I believe in Jesus, but we're still the ones on the throne. We're still the ones in charge. We're still the ones deciding. We're still the ones who read Scripture and say, yeah, I believe those parts, but not these parts. We're still the people who say, well, Jesus has this part of my life, but these other parts, I'm still in charge. I'll still decide. I'll, I'll still make decisions based on what I think or feel is best or what I want for myself. People are laying palm branches and, and coats down on the road before him. What are you holding on to that you need to lay down? It's time. Jesus is king. King in the past, king in the present, king forever. It's time to lay those things down before him. They could be really good things. Like maybe, maybe it's your family and your family has become an idol that you've set before Jesus. And it's family first even before Jesus. Maybe it's friendships. Maybe you need to lay your friendships down in front of Jesus and say, Jesus, there's something about these friends. I, when they talk, I, I know what they're saying isn't right, but I, but I listen to them instead of listening to you. Maybe it's an addiction that you have. You need to lay down and say, Jesus, I do not have control over this, but I believe you can empower me, that you can forgive me, that you can set me free. Maybe it's your career. Maybe it's your reputation. Maybe it's your pride. Maybe it's your ego. What do you need to lay down before King Jesus? Because the truth is there's only room for one on that throne. And we have to decide. Is Jesus king or is it me? My wants, my thoughts, my hopes, my dreams, my feelings. Is it society? Well, whatever society says, whatever the survey results said, whatever's most popular today, whatever they're saying on TV, that's what I'm going to go along with as well. The reality is to receive the peace that Jesus gives. First, you have to lay everything else down at his feet so your hands are free to receive it from him. Out of everyone in that crowd, those who loved him and those who hated him, there's those who want to crown him, those who want to kill him, none of them realized the type of peace that Jesus was bringing. At the top of the hill, as he's overlooking Jerusalem, you maybe remember this, he stops and he weeps, saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, if you only knew today what would bring you peace. The peace you need isn't to get rid of the Romans. The peace you need isn't to overthrow your enemies. The peace that you are looking for isn't the peace that I'm bringing. I am bringing you what you need most of all, and it's peace with God, your Father. Because that's the greatest issue in your lives. That's the greatest issue in the world. That's what has been broken, and I am coming to repair. I'm coming to undo all those sins, all that has been done, and to make things right with God your Father once again. We've covered Jesus as king in the past. We've covered Jesus as king in the present, in the context of that Palm Sunday, which brings us to the future. Ever wish you were there for some of these events? Like, don't you kind of wish you were there maybe for the Last Supper to actually sit with Jesus or, or there to uh, receive a miracle from him? Maybe some of you are struggling with health or mental health and you think, oh, if I could have just been there when Jesus was there just to reach out and touch his robes even to be healed. Or, man, I wish I could have been there on Palm Sunday and just be part of that huge crowd. I mean, better than a concert, or better than some sporting event, just in this huge crowd of people cheering for King Jesus. The good news is you will be. If you trust in Jesus, you will be. Let me read this for you from Revelation. After this, I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count from every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing, wearing white robes and were holding palm branches in their hands. And they cried out in a long, loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne and around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and worshipped God, saying, Amen, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. If you've ever wished that you could be there, here's the good news, you will be. As we gather around the throne of Jesus in heaven, as we gather around the throne, and who's on the throne? The Lamb. 
the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, Jesus, the Lamb of God who is the final sacrifice. No more sacrifices are needed. The Lamb of God who died and rose again. And he brings peace, and he gives peace all through his blood poured out for you and for me on the cross. Be seated on his throne as we gather around with palm branches saying to God, Amen. Praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. You can have peace in this life knowing that that's what's to come. Don't you like knowing how the story ends sometimes, knowing how the event is going to end? I like getting to the bottom of the water slide saying, hey, I lived. Let's do it again. We know how it all ends. And that can give us peace today. No matter what you're going through, no matter what you're struggling with, no matter what, what uh, addiction you're wrestling with or, or the, uh, how your family might be struggling or wrestling or even if it feels like everything else has fallen apart, your career is gone and everything else, you can have peace today knowing that's how it ends and that King Jesus is with you today. And no matter what happens, no matter how bad it gets, no matter what you're wrestling with, he will never leave you or forsake you because he is a good king, a great king, the perfect king who lays down his life for his sheep and his people. I promise you, the thrill of that water slide was nothing compared to the thrill we'll have as we gather around his throne. And when we're done saying all of those things, praise and glory and wisdom and thanks and honor and power, we'll say to Jesus, let's say it again. Let's do it again, because you truly are King, past, present, and forever. Amen. Let's pray together. King Jesus, we ask you would give us peace. Give us peace through you and through your sacrifice for us. Give us peace with all those places in our lives where we struggle, especially within ourselves where we wrestle with whatever it is. Maybe it's mental health or loneliness or depression or self-doubt or self-loathing. Maybe it's one of those things. Maybe it's something else. Maybe it's all of them all wrapped up together. Lord, we pray that you'd give us peace with you, that you'd tear down all the barriers we've set up, all the walls, all the excuses, all the reasons, all the sins that we've been piling up. Lord, we ask you to set us free from all those things and empower us by your Holy Spirit to live as your children, forgiven and free. King Jesus, give us peace in our families, peace between spouses and siblings, parents and children. Give us peace where there's division and disagreement, and anger. Give us peace where there's been silence. Give us peace where it seems like it's hopeless. Help us to love one another and know that sometimes disagreeing is showing love. We pray that in all those situations you would bring us peace. Lord, give us peace in our church. Give us peace where division exists. Give us peace where there's disappointment. Give us peace where there's ongoing conversations that need to be revisited again so that we can refocus on you and your word. Lord, give us peace in this nation. God, we hear more and more about the divisions. We hear more and more about the frustrations. We hear more and more about the polarities and the differences. Lord, help us to be unified around you. Help us to find peace as we trust in you. Lord, I pray for... Uh, peace uh, for Grace and Drumheller. I pray that you would bless them as they continue to faithfully serve you and passionately reach out to their community. I pray that you would grant them peace as they trust in you, knowing that you are preparing the heart and the mind of the person that will best serve them in their community. Lord, for everything else in our hearts and minds today, we commit those things to you, trusting in your Son, Jesus, who gives peace and who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses. 